it's an amazing thought that God would call people from all corners of the earth, draw them by his spirit into one place to be effective for the kingdom, to be like a stronghold in the kingdom of God. And I believe that's what Legacy Church is and what God is doing through us, that this place is a, is a part of his kingdom and it is a family. Did you know you're a part of a family? And the Bible says that he sets the solitary in a family. That's someone who's out there on their own, doing their own thing. He calls them from a place where they are lonely, where they are, you know, on their own. And he draws them into a family. And he sets them there and puts them there for a purpose, like Jordan was talking about, for a, such a time as this. And that is what this place is. It is a group of people who have come from far and wide, all over. Now, you know, we have some Karis students in this church. We have a lot of families that have moved in. Well, okay, you Karis students should have, like, shouted. and Yeah, yeah. We also have a lot of families that have moved in to be a part of Legacy Church from all over. And you know, it is important that we value the house of God that he joins us to. Value it. Put an importance on it. Now look at all you people in here today. You're, you're the faithful ones showing up to church week after week. But God, God's design is that we would be a part of a family, that we would be a part of a church. Did you know that, well, let me just tell you this. I was thinking about this, I've been thinking about this all week. Something I heard that Brother Hagen said years and years ago, he would be ministering in different places and people would ask him this question, what is the Lord doing now? And he would say this, the Lord is building strong local churches and teaching them how to flow in the spirit. Glory to God. And then sometimes he would add this, and he never changes. Glory to God. You know how when Jeremy and I, we used to be in a ministry, we traveled full time all over well, we used to be in a ministry. We, we are still in a ministry. Um, <laughs> we, we had a ministry before we had this church. And it was Pearson's Ministries International, still going strong today. And we traveled all over the world. We ministered in all kinds of countries. India, Africa. Yeah, shout if it's your country because we've got them all over here. India, Africa. Uh, different places in Europe, in England, uh, Australia. Yeah, anybody in here from Australia? We have traveled all over Mexico, Canada. We um, loved that part of our life and that season of our life. But I'll tell you this. There was a deep longing on the inside to be a part of a local body. Did you know that working in the ministry is not the same as receiving from a ministry gift? And the Bible says that God places gifts in the body, pastors, teachers, evangelists, all of these different, we could go on and on, but there is an anointing on these offices to minister the word of God to us. And we need all of them to live life to the fullest. And one of those great God, things I've experienced uh, that I never until I stood in this office of pastor did I ever realize what that office would entail and the anointing to do that job. And it's been one of the most wonderful things, the joy of my life. To, to be able to pray in a different way, to be able to, to have you to care for. Did you know it's a joy to care for people? 
and to love people. I don't mean to carry the care. I mean to take good care of them. It's a joy to pray. It's a joy to be in that. But you know what? I started to realize even more than I ever had before how important it is to know who your pastors are, who these people are, these gifts, and value the word of God that comes from these gifts and these offices. Now, I'm not telling you this for you to listen to me this morning. I'm just telling you this because I have realized the life that is in the local church. And of course, I grew up in church. I loved it. I loved the presence of God. I mean, we spent, my parents and grandparents had us uh, around the anointing and in the presence of God from the time we were in the womb. And I, we, we would lay out under the pews. We'd be so tired at night. It'd be a school night and they'd be having revival in the church. And we would be singing so late and, and, and worshiping the Lord. And it got so late. But you know what? I knew him when I was little. I knew his presence. I understand, stood what the anointing was. And you know what? When I grew up, I didn't want anything else. And how valuable and important is, us, is it for us to keep our children around the anointing all the time? When church is open, you're in church. When the anointing is there, you don't want to miss it. The psalmist said this. He said, those who are planted in the house of the Lord. That doesn't say those who are just working for the Lord Monday through Friday. That doesn't mean those who even say they're in ministry. No, those who are planted in the house of the Lord. You want to be a part of a house that God has established You want to be a part of a place where the presence of God is thick and rich in that room. There are things that you will get in the sanctuary that you will not get on your own. Did you know that? Yeah. There are things that he has called us to come together and receive. That's why he says, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together. But the the psalmist said this. He said, those who are planted in the house of the Lord... What does it mean to be planted? It means to let your roots go down deep. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. It says this, they will still be bearing fruit in old age. Is there a connection between living a long, healthy, satisfied, full life bearing fruit and being planted in the house of the Lord. There is. It's a powerful, powerful thing. I just wanted to share that, you know, that didn't have anything to do with my message this morning. But it came up in my <laughs> it came up in my heart that it's important that we value the gifts that God puts in our life. And that we value these ministry gifts that we don't just receive from one place or one office. That we find out who God, where he has set us in the body. And we get there and we don't let anything keep us from it. And we plan ourselves, no matter if we feel like it or we don't, we let our roots go down deep. And all of us will still be bearing fruit. How many have experienced that after being planted in church? Have you experienced the the fruit that comes as a result of being planted? Glory to God. I I have definitely experienced that. Thank you, Lord. You know, let me just say one more thing along these lines. Growing up in church, my parents, they did something right, okay? And not because I turned out good or my brothers turned out good, which we did. (laughs) Um, We turned out great. (laughs) Um, One thing they did, one thing they did. And we're not perfect, but we do love the Lord and we serve him. One thing they did is they always had us in service hearing the word. Did you know we went to church Monday or Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night every single week of our lives? It was very, very rare that we missed it. And we grew up in Arkansas, small town, small church wonderful church, but the word was being preached 
week after week after week, day after day after day. This is still not a part of my message, so just, we'll just go with the Holy Ghost, right? And the word was being planted in our hearts, and we were around that congregational anointing, and we were experiencing the presence of God and how he flowed, how he moved. Oh, there's nothing like it. And those words were not just good messages or sermons. Those words were seeds. And for 18 years, it was not my choice. It became my choice because that's how they raised me. But it was not my choice to show up on those days week after week after week. It was their choice to put me around it and in it. And every day that we came, Seeds were being planted in the soil of our hearts. Seeds, 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 more seeds, more seeds, more seeds. Well, what happens when a seed gets planted and it has time long enough to grow up and to produce? You can't help, but that tree that's been planted, you can't help if it grows up and becomes something great and wonderful and mighty. And that's God's goal, is that for each one of us and for our children, that we would be, the the seeds of the word of God would be richly planted into us week after week after week. Our job is to keep them around it. And week after week after week, those seeds will begin to grow up and they'll begin to produce and bear fruit. It's almost like you can't stop it. You don't want to stop it. But I just want to encourage you this morning, if this is your place and this is the family God has set you in, value it, appreciate it, let it be important in your life. There's a reason that he's put you here. Find out how you can be a part, how you can let your roots go down deep, how you can serve in the place he's put you in. Find out. Find out what that is. Get on your face before him if you need to. I know people in this church that have been so faithful. Oh, man, if I could tell all of of you that have blessed me with your faithfulness. But time and time again, showing up, being here, it's not for us. It's your ministry unto the Lord. And I just want to encourage you this morning to find out where that place is. If it's here, get in here. We love you. We welcome you. And this can be your family. But you want to be a part of a family somewhere. And not just a casual part. You want to be planted in the house or the family that God has called you to. Amen. 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 Well, why don't you guys turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I was up at 4.40 this morning. Anybody else (laughs) up early this morning with the time change? And um, did you enjoy your week last week? Wasn't that so great and wonderful? It was just the perfect timing. And Jeremy and I have been traveling a lot lately and ministry and just different things. And it was just such a good day of rest. The Lord blessed us with a new puppy, mm-hmm. and he's real cute. He's real cute, and but he he is a puppy. He's like a newborn baby, and you know sometimes that's wonderful. Sometimes other times, you know you just need your sleep. But we have a sweet new puppy at home, so the the extra rest was welcomed for us this week. Um, I I just, I wanted to share with you something. You know, last month was October overflow, and anybody experienced just God moving in your life and filling you up and over till the overflow. Yes, I know, so many testimonies coming in. We had it in our heart that this month would be uh, Thanksgiving November. And we want to focus on what it means to give thanks a lot. And this seems like a real simple subject. But as you study Thanksgiving throughout Scripture, it becomes a very big subject to the heart of God. And I wanted to read you this um, out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it says this 
in verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who, no, you know what? I'm going to back up. Verse 55, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Did you know for the born again child of God, death is not something to be feared. And once you get over your fear of death is the moment that you can truly start living your life. And it says this, um, uh, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This week, for the first time, I don't know why I haven't thought of it before, I started to realize the person who wrote this was Paul. And Paul, what he had gone through in his life up until this point. Think about it. Some of the hardships that Paul faced in his life. He was beaten. That means he was in pain. He dealt with uh, pain. He was shipwrecked at many times. He was stoned. He came face to face with robbers and thieves. Anybody in here ever dealt with that? His own countrymen came against him. That's the people that, that should have been for him. Uh, heathen and evil people came against him. He suffered persecution in his life. People consistently lied about him. He was tempted to grow weary many times. Can anyone relate to this? Ever tempted to grow weary? He was, uh, he was hurt. He had hurt and he had persecuted and he had murdered many of God's people. Do you believe that ever, we never think about this, that his past tried to haunt him and the devil tried to bring feelings of shame over his past, over things he had done? Do you ever think it's possible that the enemy tried that against him? tried to remind him of what he had done. He also mentioned that the cares of the churches, all the churches that he was over in the Lord, they would try to come on him daily. These are all hardships or perils that Paul, that Paul faced in his life. But here we hear this come out of his mouth. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I think is so interesting here. Is that Paul had so much that God had done for him in the past to be thankful for. He had so much to look back on and to thank God for. But he also was saying this phrase. Not just because of what had been done for him. But he was saying it because he had a history with him who had done those good things. He had a history with a God who had been faithful to him time and time again. And by faith, he is saying ahead of time, thanks be to God who gives me the victory through my Lord Jesus Christ. I can give thanks before I see it. And so he's, he, in the middle of all these things that he encountered, all of these issues in life, he could still give thanks. Paul had developed in the art of a thankful heart. He had developed the art of a thankful heart. Did you know that any art that someone is good at, any skill that someone becomes really good at, that you may admire or you may be good at yourself. You know, we have a lot of skilled people in this church. I was talking to Tyler yesterday about this. We have got all kinds of smart people in here. You should say amen. We have doctors in this place. We have 
engineers in this place. We have business people that are just absolutely excellent. We have ministers, a lot of ministers in this place, people who are called to be ministers. We have like excellent construction companies in this place. We have administrators in this place. We have sales people in this place. We have store clerks in this place. We, you should be shouting if it's you. Yeah, there's all, all over here. We have, we have a lot of technical people that do things I don't, you can't even wrap my brain around. But we have very, very smart people in this church. Now, who made you that way? I mean, I'm telling you, the wisdom of God can come on anyone, the anointing of God and cause you to rise up and God can take you from being living in a lowly place where maybe you came from you didn't come from an education or a background that should put you in the place that you're in but God oh in his goodness has equipped you and anointed you to do a job you might not even be qualified for it in the natural but the anointing can come on you to do a job you know I'm thinking about this uh, Daniel this isn't in my message either But I should say it's my message because it's in my message. Okay, Daniel in the Old Testament. Do you remember what it said about him? He was a man with an excellent spirit. And this excellence and this spirit of excellence opened doors for him that no man could close. I love this, what it says about him, that he, the spirit of God would come on him and he would be able to solve enigmas. You know what that is? That's solving problems that the natural man cannot solve. He would be able to, it says this about him, he could untie knots. Untie knots. What is that a picture of? Something being a a jumbled up mess that nobody can figure out, but the wisdom of God come on you and you can see how to untie that knot. Now I do this sometimes at home. Any, Any of you beautiful ladies in here have some jewelry that gets tangled up and you need to untie those gold chains. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Well, what you've got, you're gonna have to see in there, see. You're going to see deep, deep into that knot and how to untangle it and how to untie it. You know, you can check in with the Holy Ghost every single day and believe God for the wisdom to untie every knot in your life. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's a situation, you could have gotten yourself into it. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. It might be a part of your job. I'm telling you, there are people in here, the spirit of God, the spirit of excellence, the spirit of wisdom is coming on you today to do a job. And God wants to bless you in it. He wants to prosper everything you set your hands to do. But any skill... Any skill that someone becomes good at takes tens of thousands of hours in the natural to become good at that skill, to train for that skill. And you know, it's no different when it comes to spiritual things. Thanksgiving, having a thankful heart is an art and it's a skill. And as we walk with God further in life, and we walk, in, we walk by faith and we live by faith and our desire is to be pleasing to him in everything we do, we develop more and more this art of a thankful heart. I want to read a few of these scriptures to you. You know, Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. So many people wonder, how can I experience the presence of God more in my life? How can I I enter in more? How can I know him more? How can I have his tangible presence in my life? You enter in through a thankful heart. You come into his presence. God makes it simple for us, doesn't he? Just come before my presence with thanksgiving, and I can bless you. I can show up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I want to encourage you this morning to practice the art of thanksgiving. Cultivate in your life a thankful heart. Now, you know, that means that it won't always come easy. 
cultiv- cultivating something is, is really a, a practice of a farmer and his crops. Plowing ground, digging up soil, working, tilling the ground. It doesn't always come easy. Do you know what's easy on the flesh is to murmur and to complain? That's what comes easy. But a thankful heart, oh, it takes development. It takes practice. It's an art, the art of the thankful heart. As I, years and years ago, Jeremy and I were preparing to minister at a conference in Nashville. I was pregnant without knowing it with my firstborn justice. And I was laying down, resting, praying in tongues, and believing God for what I was supposed to preach that night. This was 13 years ago. And, you know, I just was laying out, you know, when you want to really experience the Lord, sometimes you should just lay in his presence. And you should just get on your face. If you need to hear from him, if you need to see something, you want to just get quiet. You know, the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. That word still is the word Rapha. And if you know what that means, Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, is our God who heals us. So that could mean to you, be healed and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. There is healing in stillness. There is light in his presence. There is revelation in that place of peace and quiet and tranquility. Now, our generation doesn't know really how to do this well. And it's a practice to get quiet before the Lord. The Bible even tells us to aim to live a quiet life. What is that? A a life that's not so noisy. A life that's not so busy. A life that is still and it brings healing to the body. Be still or be healed and know that I am God. And at that time, I was spending time just in his presence before him, waiting on him to hear what he had to say to me. And I was praying over some of these things about Thanksgiving. And I heard him say to me, so clear in my heart, I had never heard anyone say this before. Thanksgiving is the language of faith. You know, when you hear something like that from the Lord, it'll cause you to go back and think about everything you've ever learned about a subject, right? And I went back and I thought, this is, I'm going to have to examine this to see if it's right. What I'm hearing is right, but no, this is right. Hebrews tells us, I'm going to read you this out of Hebrews. It says this in in chapter 13, verse 15, through him, that's talking about Jesus, Jesus is our new and living way to the Father. He's the way and the reason we can even go into the presence of God. Because of him, we have a new and living way. Glory to God. And we should be, every time we come before the presence of God, we should thank him for Jesus. He should be the beginning of our thanksgiving. Jesus is the beginning of our thanksgiving. It says here, through him, speaking of Jesus, let us continually, what is continually all the time, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And I saw it. If there is faith working in my heart, there will be thanksgiving on my lips. You can tell that faith is working in your life, is producing in your life, is bearing fruit in your life 
if thanksgiving is on your lips. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. Thank you, Lord. Thanksgiving is the language of faith. Even like Paul in this situation his whole life, he didn't choose to talk about all the hardships all the time. He chose to have an attitude of thanksgiving. That he looked on the bright side. If you have a thankful heart, you're positive all the time. You're always looking on the bright side. You're always looking at what God is going to do for you. How he's going to come through for you. Even he says here, death, where is your sting? Where is it? I don't feel it. No matter what I've gone through, I don't feel it because I'm expecting to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm expecting that he's going to come through for me. I know in whom I have believed and I can trust that there's good things just ahead of me. Thanksgiving will cause you to overcome in every area of your life, being a thankful person. Do you know, Thanksgiving is the answer for an anxious mind. If you've ever dealt with anxiety in this place, if you've ever dealt with torment, fear, Thanksgiving is your answer. I want to tell I want to read this to you out of Philippians chapter 4. And this is a powerful, powerful passage on your thought life and how to live with a, a kind of joy that most of the world doesn't live with. Did you know that's possible to the believer and to the child of God? It says this in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord most of the time. No, it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 6 says, be anxious or have anxiety about nothing. Nothing? You can go through your life and obey what the Bible says? Yeah, you can. It says this is how you do it. But in everything, don't be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And if you're looking at there, we have three different things happening here. Your prayer is those things where you're addressing God. You're acknowledging him. Your supplication is really your request unto God. And then you add, you mix thanksgiving, which is your faith in God. And that's the moment that you start to overcome. And it says this, right at that point, when you've mixed faith, you know, I never saw that until this week, that that thanksgiving is the mixing of the faith in that prayer. When you add thanksgiving and you start to, to praise God and thank him, give him glory, you are releasing faith. That's the moment that your faith is released, that thanksgiving. You got you to gotta think about this. You, you, so many of us, if, you, if I had two containers up here and they represented our heart, so many of us would have, uh, you know, a, it filled up just a little bit with, with thanksgiving, with thanks. And the majority of this other this other container over here, most of us would have it filled up to the brim with care, cares. We would be careful, full of care, instead of thankful, full of thanks. And I just really believe that once that gets evened out, and those cares, you start to cast your cares, let them go from you, don't, don't allow it to fill up the chambers of your heart 
and that thanksgiving rises up to fill to the top and overflowing, that's the moment that you start to overcome. That's being filled to the full. That's overflowing. And it says right here, the moment that that happens, you mix that thanksgiving with your prayer. At that point, it says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You don't even know how you, you don't even understand how you could have peace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will be a guard over your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then it tells you what to think about. This is what you fill up your mind and your heart with. Brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, anything praiseworthy meditate on these things and these things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the God of peace will be with you the answer for an anxious mind is a thankful heart you don't have to live with fear anymore you don't have to live with anxiety. You don't have to be disturbed in your mind. You don't have to wake up in the morning sad anymore. All you got to do is open up your mouth and begin to thank him and praise him and give him glory. I'm telling you, you can overcome in every area of your life by being thankful. You know what else Thanksgiving does? It is the cure for entitlement. We are, all of us, are going to be tempted with this at some point in our life and have been. Where you believe that someone else owes you something. Thanksgiving is the cure. When you start to get thankful for what God has done for you. How he has blessed you. How he is your God and you need no one else to do anything for you. You've got a God who can provide for you. You've got a God who can open doors for you. You've got a God who has been there time and time again. A God who can love you. A God who can, sh he can just show up and just let his peace fill your soul. You don't need anybody else to do that for you. You don't have to be upset when someone doesn't do for you. You can love without hindrance. Because you have a thankful heart. A heart full of thanksgiving. Every day making a habit. Waking up in the morning with a thankful heart. Going to bed at night with a thankful heart. I love this about Paul because he said in the middle of all this that he's gone through. None of these things move me. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. What is that? I'm going to stop thinking about myself. I'm going to get out of this realm of self-centeredness, and I'm going to step over into the realm of faith. I'm going to step over into the realm of thanksgiving. And when I get over into that place, I'm not moved by anything in life. And I can finish my race with joy. Finish it with joy. God's plan and his will is that we would live in the joy of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in the joy of the Lord, every day, every moment of every day. And it would fill us up to overflowing. The only way we get there is through thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. I was thinking about this. The peace of God comes as a result of a thankful heart. You know, when I, a few years back, some of you that have been a part of the church for a while, you'd remember this, but my mom moved to heaven suddenly. And it was not what we planned. It was not what we expected. It was not what we believed for. 
And the days leading up to that, the Lord had led me to go down and see her, which was so supernatural in itself because I didn't know that I, really, I had a sense, but I, I didn't really know. I went down to visit her and they, the, the morning that, um, that I was supposed to leave, she woke up unconscious and they took her by ambulance to um, the hospital. And I remember driving by myself to the hospital. Jeremy wasn't with me. The kids weren't with me. Do you know you can, you can have peace when it's you and God on your own with him? He's there for you. You don't have to get it from another person. And I was on my way to the hospital. And you would think that I would be just torn up on the inside. That I would be in pieces, right? in the natural, that I would be losing it. I, I would not know how to cope. That's what the, that's what the world does. Yeah. But when you're walking with God, the Bible says that we don't sorrow like those who sorrow yeah. in the world. Yeah. And I remember driving and this, I could feel like this pressure on my heart. And it was like it was pushing against my heart. And I had joy. I was singing. I was worshiping the Lord, spending time with him. And I just asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what is that pressure on my heart? Like, what is that? And I heard him say so clearly to me, Sarah, you're guarding your heart. You've put a guard up. And you're not letting that grief and that sorrow overwhelm you. You put a guard up. There are going to be plenty of opportunities in life to overcome. Even in the face of death. And a lot of people in our camp, we don't like to talk about this. <laughs> right? But even in the face of death, when thanksgiving and praise and the presence of God is so real to us, we have the ability to overcome in every situation. We have an opportunity to be like Paul and say, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? No thanks be to God. For I don't, maybe I don't see it in my natural mind. Maybe I don't feel it in my flesh. But thanksgiving, it gives thanks ahead of time. It gives thanks before you see it. It gives thanks. A thankful heart will give thanks in the middle of the worst situations because you know in whom you have believed. And so I just put a guard over my heart. And I continue to keep the guard up. Now, you know, when she went to heaven and moved to heaven, of course there were tears of course, there you have a soul. We have a soul. That's not wrong to feel, to, to, to experience those things. But I remember right after, we were about to have her celebration service. And I heard the Lord speak to me so clearly. And he said, Sarah, I want you to rejoice with her today. And didn't I say in my word to rejoice with those who rejoice? And I thought, wait a second, is she sad at all right now? She's so happy. I don't care how much she loved me and those grandkids. She would not be coming back here for none of us. And your loved ones too. No matter how much they love you, you can forget it. You can forget it. They're not coming back for you. They are way too good. Way too good. And I heard him say to me, rejoice with her. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And that morning I got up and I decided I'm putting on a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. And I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and I'm going to be glad because what is she doing today? Oh, she's, walk, she's riding her bike on the streets of glory. She's running down the streets of gold. She's getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. She has, oh, it's so good. I mean, Y'all, the other day I had a lady, I was talking to this lady.
And she was actually the breeder for my dog. And um, I, she told me, she's like, Sarah, I'm not breeding anymore because um, I actually went to Cabo a couple years ago and got COVID. And after I got COVID, they put me in the hospital on a ventilator. And I had a near-death experience. And she said, Sarah, I literally left my body and went, I was going toward the heavenly city. And she said, uh, she said, when I was, I, I, it was like I came out of my body, which if you know by the scripture, I'm telling you, there is no sting in death. When you come out of that body, you're going to be so happy. You're going to be rejoicing. You're going to never, you'll be like, what was I ever afraid of? She says she came out of that body and she started to go up and she was like in the sky and she said it was like she had no, nothing holding her back anymore. No body, no weight, no feelings of discouragement. She said it was all, she was just void of anything bad. And she said, I have never felt peace like that in my whole life. I've never felt peace. She said, the thing that bothered me the most was I didn't even think about how much I missed my family. I had no, there was nothing sad. There was nothing bad. She said, I even saw the emeralds around a mountaintop, the emerald stone. She said, you read Revelation chapter 4, and you will read all about exactly what I saw. And then below me, I saw the lights in the city. And I was trying not to look at the light because I knew if I looked at the light, I was going to go to the light. And she said, I asked the Holy Ghost, can I please have a little bit more time with my, great -grand my grandchildren? And he, he let her come back. And I thought it was so amazing to think about the peace that fills heaven. And the peace that happens the moment you slip out of your body like a hand slips out of a glove. You, you, death, where is your sting? And I remember at that time with my mom, I began to rejoice in the Lord. And the Lord said to me, he said, you have a choice. You can either be self-aware and sad or heaven-aware and glad. And doesn't the Bible tell us to rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Not some of the time. Not when you feel like it. Not when things have gone well. It says no always. And again, I say rejoice. Because God knows the power that Thanksgiving releases in our life. Victory belongs to those who give thanks a lot in the space between where they are and where they want to be. That's who victory belongs to. And thanksgiving is not just when you receive the gift, after you receive the gift. See, Jesus, in his goodness and his kindness, has given us, has given us everything as a free gift. His gift of righteousness, everything good that that in, in, encompasses. I mean, that is all a gift from him. But what if you were to stand before him and say, no, I don't want that. I can't take that. I'm not worthy of that gift. I can't receive that. I haven't been good enough. I've made too many mistakes. Do you think Paul was thinking about his life and his past? The devil was trying to haunt him with his past. But I'm telling you, Thanksgiving will lift up its eyes. You will have plenty of time to get back up. And I don't think, I don't care how perfect you think or how, how, how bad you think you've been. None of us have been perfect enough to, to have arrived. And this whole life long, we are going to have the opportunity to get back up. To get back up on our, on our feet. To get back up on our faith. And to go on with God. And the only way to do it is to go ahead and open up your mouth and thank him for everything good he's done, everything good he's doing, and everything that's yet to come. And to, to by faith, release thanksgiving. Because thanksgiving is the language of faith. It is the language of the overcomer. It's the language of the joyful soul. You want to find out? How to get over into the place you want to be? 
You just, all you had to do is simply start thanking God. All you have to do is develop and practice this art of thanksgiving. You can thank him now for what you see years down the road. Why not start now? Why not start releasing faith now? Why not start now? Thank you, Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in, for you in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, if you're singing a song and it is not full of thanksgiving, it is not, it is not pleasing to God. And it's doing nothing for your life. I learned a long time ago, I got rid of a lot of music. I even got rid of a lot of Christian music because it wasn't building me up and it wasn't causing me to overflow. I want to read this one to you. This is out of Colossians 2.7. Um, it says, be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This is exactly what I'm talking about. The overflow of faith is the overflow of thanksgiving. You can't have faith working for you without a thankful heart. If you notice yourself complaining about your job, you're not in faith about that job. If you notice yourself murmuring about and complaining about your husband or your wife, you're not in faith about their life and your life and in faith for them to get it. No, Complaining about anything. Venting. Talking about things that, that, you know, so many times we mess up. We mess up our victory with our words. And they've, we released it at one point and God went to work for us, but we, we stopped it with our words. Do you remember how God said that it, it, they talked about, it talks about in Psalm 78 that the children of Israel, they limited God in their lives because they were unthankful, because they started complaining. They couldn't be healed because their, their heart was full of care and full of um, complaining and full of darkness. You know, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 1. That when you start to complain, that darkness comes in. But thankful people are always seeing the light. They're always seeing the next step to take. They're always seeing what to do, where to go, how God is leading them. Thanksgiving is the language of faith, and faith is what pleases God. Thank you, Lord. So established in the faith and abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. It's like the overflow of thanksgiving is the overflow of faith. And you can know that it's working for you. Thank you, Lord. Let me read you one more passage of Scripture. We're doing good on time today. I preach quicker than Jeremy. He's a Copeland, so we're not going to fault him. No, we love it. We love the word. We want more. I'm going to read to you out of Second Chronicles chapter 20. You can turn there with me. This passage has always been such a awesome one to me because um, I love to praise God. I love to worship God. You know that from the time I was young, I knew that I had a calling on my life to minister to the Lord in song and to sing to the Lord, to write songs and, and to minister in music. And, you know, I had to, I've had to learn a lot of things over the years in regards to what makes that effective. I'm still learning today. 
And I remember I started playing the piano in youth band when I was in sixth grade. And I started to learn and be around the anointing from the perspective of ministering, not just receiving. Did you know you have to have faith to minister as well as faith to receive from the Lord? It takes faith. And I started to learn some of these things in sixth grade. And some of you guys, some of our teens in here, they're going to start experiencing this more uh, uh, pretty soon, actually, when we start having more youth services. But I, I remember playing the piano in youth band and being so hungry for the presence of the Lord. And as I continued in the years following, I started to lead worship for our children's ministry at our church and for our college ministry. And those, in those years of serving the Lord, the Lord revealed himself to me in a lot of ways. But I was really hungry for it. You know, I could tell in certain services when the presence of God would be stronger than at other times. And I could tell when it was dry. I could tell when I was leading and it was dry. And I was hungry for something more. It's, you know, the presence of God manifest among us is not automatic. The psalmist said this, he said, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make your bed, my bed in hell, you're there. He said, where can I go from your presence? And the truth is that God is everywhere. And if you're born again, child of God, he lives on the inside of you. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But that doesn't mean that his presence is more real everywhere and flowing through everyone at the same time. What makes his presence more real for us? More, how, how do we become more aware of it? How do we come in here on Sunday morning and it's so rich and tangible like it was this morning in this place? How do we experience him like that all the time? And I was hungry for this. I didn't want to come and show up and be in a worship service and it be dry. I didn't want to come in and it be lifeless. I want God in the sanctuary. I want him. He's the one that I want. When he walks in the room, everything good's good. And so I was hungry for some of these things. And I began to pray and I began to seek the Lord. I, I began to, to ask him, Lord, why was it so anointed at this point? And why was it so dry at this point? I want to know, why did you choose to make yourself known? Why did you choose to show up at this time more than on this occasion? What is it? Well, his presence goes with us everywhere, right? He even lives in us. So I sought him, and I said, Lord, show me. And over the years, he began to teach me about thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his presence, into his courts with praise. Not cranky, not crabby, not complaining, not murmuring, not feeling entitled but content, but thankful. You know, contentment is the proof of a heart full of thanks. Thank you, Lord. And I realized so many things about Thanksgiving. You know, the, the Jewish people, they would sing Psalm 100 when they would come into the house of God, they would sing this song that we were just reading. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. And you know what they would thank God for? Everything he had done for them the previous week. Does that sound like what we do in church on Sunday morning? 
Legacy Church is a bunch of thankful, grateful people. And I can tell because I get up here on a Sunday morning and it is like a rush of his presence. You know, the Bible says, oh, this is, thank you, Lord, I remember this. Prayer is powerful. And prayer is dy dynamic. It has the power to be like dynamite in our life. You can read about that in James. God hears our prayer. But he inhabits our praises. He hears and he listens to our prayer. But he comes and makes his home in our praise and in our thanks. He shows up. He demonstrates himself. He makes his presence known. Oh, prayer is powerful. But what about when your praise life comes up to the same level as your prayer life? That's when you start to see miracles. That's when you start to see your body change. That's when you start to see God come through for you time and time again. Your finances, every area of life. God wants to be there. He wants to work. you got to work with him. And you do it by doing it his way. Entering his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, guys, why don't you all go ahead and come up, and we're just going to take a minute and thank the Lord and praise him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I didn't read you this about Jehoshaphat. Should I tell you about Jehoshaphat really quick? We, hey, we have like five more minutes. Are we good? Okay. Let me tell you this. In verse 20, it says it happened that, sorry, chapter 20, verse 1, it happened after this, that the people of Moab, the people of Ammon, and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now, we, we read here about these different groups that were coming against him. But you know what this represents? Anytime something is coming against you in your life, it is not a person that is coming against you. It is what the First Corinthians tells us about uh, this, these are influences. Influences influencing people these are, these are not just, don't, don't think that it's just people coming against you. Your fight is against something you can't see. And the enemy will come against you, and he will not come against you with natural weapons like knives and a gun and things like that. No, he might if you live somewhere else. Maybe here. Um, but you know what? He doesn't come at you with that. He comes at you with un unseen weapons like discouragement. Like unbelief, like, like uh, he'll come at you with, with unseen weapons. And you have to know when he's coming against you. And so in this passage, they begin to come against King Jehoshaphat. In verse 2, a great, they told him, a great multitude is coming against you beyond the sea from Syria. Um, it says this in verse 3, that Jehoshaphat feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. He actually began to experience fear. But this is what he did. He set himself to seek the Lord. What is that? To seek his presence. And how do you go into his presence? With thanksgiving. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Now if you're dealing with something in your life, fear keeps coming against you, anxiety... You can set yourself to seek the Lord until he relieves you of that fear. Uh, the psalmist said, I sought the Lord and he delivered me and he freed me from all fear. That is what belongs to you, the freedom from fear. It says this, Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. I love this. Jehoshaphat, he stood in the assembly of Judah. Where is that? All of them together. All of them gathered together. In the house of the Lord. How important is it to have your faith, friends, your people who can believe with you, like Jay was telling about their house. They came together in the house of the Lord. It says this in verse 6. 
they begin to cry out to the Lord and they said, Oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God? Are you not the one we have a history with? That's what he's saying. We've seen you move for us time and time again. Are you not that one? Oh, he's saying you're the one. This is Thanksgiving. He's looking back and he's remembering what God had done for him. Calling to mind his faithfulness. Feeding on his faithfulness. Are you not the one who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they, dwell, and they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, and famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear us, and you will save Thank you, Lord. Did you know there should be things that we are thanking God for every day in our life? I'm going to tell you a few of them. Father, I thank you for Jesus. That he has been made unto me wisdom. That he is, oh, he's my deliverer. He'll take me, he will, he's my good shepherd. He'll take me out of a mess and he'll bring me into a wide open green pasture. Father, I want to thank you today for the Holy Spirit. Oh, he is my comforter. I want to thank you for the comfort which, with which you have comforted me with. Father, I want to thank you that he's my teacher. That he teaches me every day and in every way. That he leads me and guides me. And that I, I'm thankful that I'm always in the right place at the right time doing the right thing with the right people. Father, I want to thank you for my family. I want to thank you for the gifts that you have given me. Help me to be thankful for them and not despise them. Help me to look at them in the light of how you see them. And I'm thankful for them. Father, I want to thank you that I'm filled with the knowledge of your will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want to thank you that the eyes of my understanding are open and I see what to do. I know what to do. I want to thank you that the spirit of wisdom is on me. And the spirit of understanding, and I know what to do. I know how to untie knots. I know how to solve problems. Father, I want to thank you for your mighty angels. I want to thank you that they have surrounded me all the days of my life. I want to thank you that they surround my children. I want to thank you that they surround my family. And no weapon formed against us will prosper. I want to thank you that you've been there for me when others have turned their back, when others have lied about me, when others have come against me, that you have been faithful to watch over your word and perform it in my life. Father, I want to thank you for your presence on me. I want to thank you for the anointing. I want to thank you that I'm equipped to do my job. I want to thank you that you are my provider. That you provide all my needs according to your riches and glory. Oh, I want to thank you that you've been there for me time and time again. Whether I feel like it or whether I don't, I trust you and I believe your word. I want to thank you, Father, that you are good to me. So they begin to stand before the Lord and they begin to praise him and remember everything good that he had done for him and how he was big and mighty, mighty to save. They were thanking him for everything in the past. And then, then he said this in verse 12, Oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. When you thank God, you turn all your attention to him and you begin to magnify him and glorify him and nothing can overtake you. You are safe in the secret place of the Almighty. It says this, verse 13, I love this. Now all of Judah and their little ones, their kids were with them, and their wives, they all stood before the Lord to acquire of the Lord, to praise Him and to thank Him. 
It says this, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, and the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the son of Asaph. In the midst of the assembly is where this happened. Is it important to come together in the assembly? He said this, listen, all you of Judah and those inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed because this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but the battle is God's. Now, the moment that you hear the word of God is the moment you can start praising and thanking God. You don't have to wait till the battle is over. You don't have to wait till you see the end result. No, no, no. When you get the word from God is the moment you start thanking him. He says this, tomorrow go down against them. He'll give you something to do too. He'll give you a way to walk it out. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerul. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them for the Lord is with you. You know, all you need is one word from God. All you need is one word from God to step out and begin thanking and praising him to see your victory come to pass. And then it says this, verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. This is humility. And Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they bowed before the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. It says the Levites and the children of um, the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with loud voices high. Had it happened yet? No, they praised him before it happened. So they rose early in the morning and they went out. And Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, you and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army. And they begin to say this. Praise the Lord. Give thanks unto the Lord. For his mercy endures forever. And as they begin to sing, and as they begin to give thanks, and as they begin to praise, the Lord, the Lord, their part was the thanks. Their part was the praise. But the Lord, he began to fight their battle for them. Why don't we just stand up right now? Oh, thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, thank you, Lord. All you need is a word from God. All you need is a word you can stand on. And when you've done all you can do and when you have prayed all you can pray, it's time to lift up your voice and it's time to give Him thanks and to give Him praise like it's done, like it's finished. All those people, those singers and those praisers, Why does it make any sense to put them out at the front of the army? It's like all of us up here. Do we have, do we all look like we have a bunch of big muscles and, and you know, no, 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 we have a weapon. And it's, our song is our sword. And our praise, you know, the psalmist said, let the high praise of God be in your mouth, a two-edged sword in your hand. Let your words, man, he just God himself, he will utter his voice and 150,000 will be wiped out. 
How much power is in your words? How much power is in your thanksgiving? How much power is in your praise? Let's go ahead and let's just do this for a minute, just give Him praise. Oh, we praise you, Lord. We thank you for the victory. Oh, we are overcomers. We are overcomers. We are the victory. We are the victorious ones. Oh, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Oh, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we thank you, Father. 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 You can just get caught up in the realm of thanksgiving. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you see it in His Word, oh, you can count on Him. You can thank Him for it. If you see it in His Word, if it's a promise, you can thank Him for it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Father. Oh, you've been faithful. And you don't stop now. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Oh, thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, Father, thank you, Lord. There's people in here that are re ready to release faith this morning. You're, re you're ready to release thanksgiving that's going to turn your whole world around. You're going to start waking up in the morning with a smile on your face. No matter what you feel like, no matter what it looks like. Oh, a thankful heart. Oh, a thankful heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.